Hi, Karen. How are you? Good. How are you? So, um, just for the benefit of the rest of the group, the agenda today is to um, go through uh, an open EBS presentation as uh, my dates are considering um, submitting open EBS as a, as a CNCF project. Um, Evan or, or Karen, do you want to um, give some more background around that before we start the presentation? Uh, sure. Hi, Alex. Hi, everybody. This is Evan. And uh, yeah, it, really, we will, of course, focus on the, the demo and the, the how, right? What is open EBS and how does it work? Uh, just quickly, um, I think Karen's sharing the slides, but the company is called Maya Data um, and has been around for a number of years now. Open EBS uh, was started in late 2016. And really our, our mission is something we call uh, data agility. Um, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that and happy to answer any you know, questions about the, the business. Um, but, it, but it's an open source project that's a little more open EBS is a little more than two years old now. Um, and uh, now does have a bunch of users. We are by far the largest contributor, although there are, um, we're about 70 people to give you an idea and there's 350 total contributors. Many of those are, you know, small contributors. Um, so one reason we would want to contribute uh, the project potentially, of course, is to make it more welcoming to, um, you know, to other other companies uh, and other contributors. Um, yeah, Karen, what what else would you say, or are there questions maybe before we dive into architecture and and, and what Open EBS is? <clears throat> And thanks for having us, of course, uh, today. Oh, no, no, very welcome. This, this is a great opportunity to learn about, about Open EBS. Um, I guess we'll, you know, we can start off with the, we can start through the presentation and um, I don't know, do you prefer to have questions at the end or, or sort of should we make this interactive? Yeah, I, I think let's make it interactive. Um, I have around uh, 20 minutes of uh, uh, planned uh, presentation with that includes the demo. Um, so we can actually uh, make it interactive. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. I think uh, this uh, team here is uh, very well aware of the storage uh, space. Um, uh, but I would uh, typically introduce uh, OpenEBS um, in a way where you kind of compare it with uh, Calico and Planel for. Uh, how they provide the network capabilities by using the underlying mix. Uh, OpenEBS provides the storage services to the pods by using the devices that are already attached to the nodes. And uh, uh, Evan gave a good introduction on the background of the project, uh, a little bit about uh, the way or uh, the design principles that uh, we had in mind when starting the project. Uh, we uh, wanted it to be completely microservices based and uh, we uh, quickly moved on to make it uh, Kubernetes native. Uh, so the entire project is uh, delivered as containers and orchestrated by Kubernetes uh, itself. Uh, the other things that resonated well with the user community are it's uh, very easy to set up and uh, this the same uh, ease of use and the uh, interactions that uh, the flow that you get whether you're running in um, on-premise or on the cloud um, uh, just because you're running it as a microservices you kind of uh, use the same set of management tools that you use to manage uh, Kubernetes itself it, uh, so now we have uh, uh, it's been around the years just, hey Karen just, just just a quick question here so um, is it's, it, it, it's, it's obviously running in a container, but, but do we, um, are there sort of any uh, kernel modules or any sort of uh, system level uh, uh, dependencies that, that need to be considered or, or is it just all user level at this stage? Perfect. So it is definitely all um, user space. Uh, it doesn't have any kernel dependencies. Uh, in fact, actually, 
the PVs that are exposed uh, are exposed as ISCSI PVs. So that's the only dependency that it has to connect to the uh, storage services. But the actual storage layer itself does not have any kind of dependencies. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, we uh, Evan actually did a blog on uh, container attached storage and uh, this category well about a year. Uh, now we have uh, many uh, storage companies that fall into that category. Uh, uh, storage OS, uh, Rancher, Tongon, and Fortress, all of them being uh, uh, a CAS kind of an architecture, so, which basically uh, means that they are running within the Kubernetes ecosystem by uh, without having any dependencies outside. Uh, we did uh, present OpenEBS uh, about a year ago to the same group. Uh, 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 we were at 0 0.5 version at the time. Since then, a lot of things have happened in terms of uh, stabilizing the product. And then we do have a lot of users using it in production right now. Um, and we are at a stage where we were thinking, uh, yeah, let's actually get uh, some additional feedback from this group and uh, see uh, what the group has to say about pushing it into a CNCF sandbox. All right. Um, I'll just give a quick uh, demonstration of how it works, and then we will uh, dive into what are the different components uh, or the architecture of OpenEBS. Right. Um, so I just converted it to a slide mode. Uh, so you, typically, uh, you start off with a Kubernetes uh, cluster uh, where uh, there are some uh, hard disks, or uh, if you are running in the cloud, some kind of uh, devices attached to it. So the cluster administrator typically comes in and says, okay, uh, let me just uh, set up OpenEPS, which installs uh, some control plane components, as I call them. Uh, these are cluster level components, and there are some node level components. For example, Node Disk Manager is uh, one of the components that actually runs as a daemon set on all the nodes, uh, which can help discover the devices attached to the node. It goes ahead and actually creates a disk resources, uh, Kubernetes resources. Um, by the way, everything is uh, managed. The configuration of this entire storage system is stored as uh, Kubernetes uh, custom resources. Okay. So once we have these uh, uh, disks discovered, then the uh, cluster administrator can set up uh, what we call as uh, storage pools. Um, uh, there are multiple data engines that we support, so CStore is one of them. Uh, so CStore can run by making use of one or uh, more disks that are attached to the node. Uh, and they kind of get created on all the uh, nodes. This kind of uses a shared, uh, uh, shared storage model. Uh, once you do that, like any other storage uh, uh, provider, we have to create a storage class that says uh, provide the volumes from these uh, storage pools. Right? At this point, you, um, your application developers come in and uh, they can launch a pod that makes use of a PC associated with the OpenEV storage class. Right? And uh, as part of the provisioning or a PV, uh, a new pod gets spawned for that particular volume. Uh, that's nothing but an ISCSI target. And a logical LUNs are created, or uh, uh, what we call as replicas, on the, uh, different storage pools. and this is totally controlled by some policies that you can set via storage class um, in terms of how many replicas you want. And CStore target is the one that actually does a synchronous replication to the different replicas uh, that are configured. Right? Once uh, the uh, replicas are attached to the target, uh, the provisioner goes ahead and uh, creates a PV object. And uh, it uh, basically uses the entry ISCC volume right now to attach uh, to the uh, port. And then you are basically running your workload. Uh, any questions I can take at this point of time? Mm, no, that, that sounds fine. All right, cool. So, uh, as I said, uh, CStore is um, one of the engines that we introduced in 0 0.7 and is uh, uh, definitely gaining a lot of uh, adoption because it uh, kind of effectively makes use of the block devices attached to the nodes. Uh, prior to this, we uh, uh, since the inception of the project, we had what we call as uh, Jiva uh, data engine. Uh, it's a, a kind of a core for the Rancher uh, long on uh, engine. Uh, the setup sounds similar, but uh, in in case of uh, Jiva, it uh, basically uses the uh, uh, host path uh, that's available on the nodes. It could be coming from the same OS disk or uh, additional ephemeral disks that are attached to the Kubernetes nodes. 
and the same concept of creating a storage pool, which is nothing but specifying the host path where the uh, data has to be stored. Uh, so the steps are uh, kind of similar. So I'll just uh, quickly go through this one. Uh, the difference, though, is uh, with respect to Jiva, you end up um, uh, launching uh, each replica itself as a new pod. Whereas in C store, you can make use of the uh, uh, same uh, pod for multiple uh, volumes. It was the same way, right? Um, since we started using this uh, host path for the Jiva replicas, replicas and then uh, with uh, the port security policies coming in at uh, uh, the into Kubernetes and restricting the usage of host path uh, volumes, um, we went into dynamic provisioning of the local PVs, uh, uh, host path based local PVs. Uh, this is something similar that Rancher and OpenPVs are doing now. Uh, but we Kind of are also seeing the uh, a separate category of uh, applications that can actually do their own replication. Um, they, they don't really need a lot of replication capabilities at the storage engine. So we are now supporting um, from 0 0.9 what we call as open release local PVs. It frankly makes use of the uh, control plane capabilities that we already have with respect to node disk manager that can discover the disk attached to the nodes. Uh, or uh, you can actually configure based on the host path. Uh, a storage class that can dynamically provision a local PV for the applications. Right. Uh, these are uh, some feature comparisons. Uh, what it really means is um, uh, with the C store, uh, the st storage is much more optimized for taking uh, snapshot clones. Uh, and it, it also has a little bit of a less overhead in terms of the number of pods required to uh, provide the storage uh, services. So with uh, Jiva, uh, we uh, support replication uh, and uh, with local PVs are for those that don't really need those uh, services. Okay, um, are you, uh, sorry, go on. Uh, are you leveraging the CSI snapshots? Uh, so this uh, in 0 0.9, uh, we are actually moving to uh, CSI driver. Uh, currently, it makes use of the external storage uh, provisioner. The snapshots are coming from the external storage depository. Okay. Um, another question on the on the engines. So. Um, is, is, is there a plan to use one engine over the other or, or uh, are you looking to have sort of multiple engines in the product longer term? We are planning to have multiple engines. Um, so today these are controlled by the um, administrator in terms of uh, storage classes. We, we are definitely looking at uh, providing some operators that can automatically choose the engine based on the application capabilities. Uh, depending on the application requirements in terms of what features are needed from the underlying storage system. Right, okay. Um, and I think you mentioned that, that Jiva um, sort of was, was based on the uh, Longhorn project from, from Rancher. Does, is, is Rancher still involved in, in or, or sort of contributing to Jiva at all? Uh, so we actually forked out and then uh, uh, we changed the way uh, some of the components work. Though the underlying uh, storage capabilities are the same, but the way the uh, management of these engines happen is uh, different with OpenAPS compared to how it works in Rancher itself. Uh, we are definitely in sync with the data capabilities, but not in the management capabilities. Oh, okay, so, so it's effectively a standalone fork at this stage. That's right. We do have some of the changes that we make at the data layer, uh, but the management uh, pieces remain independent. Okay. Uh, and the uh, replication here is not using the storage's own replication capability, right? So you are implementing the replication part. Uh, that's correct. In both the C store and Jiva, we are uh, implementing the replication capabilities. Okay. And the uh, clone as well? Clone is also 
uh, implemented at uh, Jiva level, so, not at the storage level, or right? It, it's implemented at the data engine. It's uh, supported in C store volumes. Flow is okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, so for the purposes of of um, you know, for the purposes of C store, is there a difference between snapshots and clones in in the sense that you know, is is a is a clone just a fully populated snapshot in this instance? Right. So uh, C store is uh, kind of a copy on write file system. So the clones uh, are uh, they basically share the common data with the source volumes, but they actually uh, completely work as their own volumes as well. So the capacity required for the clones is for the additional data that we edit or uh, write. Okay, and is and is all of the all of the um, all of the license for all of these um, different engines the same? Is it just the Apache two point zero? So that's a good question. Um, so some of the engines. Uh, uh, the code that is written by the OpenEBS is all Apache licensed. Um, that's, uh, I, I will actually go to the repositories and probably we can check that one. Uh, it's actually the feedback that I'm looking for from this group in terms of uh, what it takes to get into CNCF in terms of licenses. All right, understood. Okay, we can discuss that afterwards then. Um, all right, so uh, probably a quick uh, dive into the architecture of uh, how this works. Right. So uh, I kind of divide these uh, components that we have into cluster level and node uh, level components. Uh, uh, the easiest way to understand uh, now that CSI is kind of become a common language. Uh, so we have uh, controller and node agent kind of components, um, and uh, these are basically running on all the uh, nodes. Uh, along with that, uh, we also, while the storage managers are mostly about uh, data engine operators as well as uh, the uh, interfaces to CSI or the uh, external storage provisioners, NTM is primarily concerned with managing the devices attached to the nodes and uh, how do you control basically an in inventory management of the underlying uh, storage devices. Uh, we can actually extend uh, these uh, components with other open source projects uh, like uh, Valero uh, for uh, uh, the entire ARP for performing backup and uh, restore kind of solutions. And uh, MyData also uh, uses the OpenEBS uh, storage components to provide their uh, uh, SaaS service to manage, uh, provide insights into the storage infrastructure for uh, enterprises. Um, there could be other uh, add-ons that we can add that can integrate into these open source projects as well. Um, and while these are all the management uh, related uh, components, uh, the core data engine co components get spawned when the cluster administrator either creates a pool or the volumes. Uh, these are uh, uh, components that come and go uh, depending on the life cycle of the volumes and the pools. Uh, we are also uh, coming up with an OpenEBS operator in 0 0.9 that will um, uh, that kind of controls all the various control plane uh, components and uh, helps with the uh, upgrades and uh, such. Okay. Uh, any questions on this before I get into each of these components in a little bit more detail? Um, so. Am I to understand that you're, you're, so you're doing CSI today? Uh, right, CSI is actually getting developed in the branch. One of the reasons why, the, why we didn't go ahead with that is we are completely Kubernetes native. The capabilities provided in the external storage provisioner were good enough and was pretty backward compatible with all the uh, uh, versions. Uh, we do have customers that are running still in uh, Kubernetes 1.9 um, versions. Um, so we, we are definitely going with uh, CSI and uh, just to make sure we are backward compatible with those customers, right? It's coming up in uh, 0.9. Right. And of course, all the new enhancements are coming up in CSI, so we are uh, we decided to move ahead with uh, migrating to CSI. OK. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the way node device manager works, uh, so you typically have a daemon set uh, that's running on the uh, on all the Kubernetes nodes. It has access to the uh, device subsystem, and it uh, basically can detect the current devices and also like um, uh, devices that get detached, attached, etc., and creates a device CR HAMLs for them. Uh, it also has uh, integrations into uh, CHS libraries that can actually probe for smart capabilities and also other de device attributes, and it uh, creates a disk CRs. Uh, these are typically created for the devices that are backed by physical disks. And uh, this also helps in uh, gathering some kind of a smart metrics uh, from the underlying devices. And uh, since these are all running um, uh, just like any other Kubernetes uh, applications, you can make use of the same infrastructure uh, uh, systems that you have, like uh, Prometheus or uh, uh, Elasticsearch or uh, those things to monitor these uh, applications as well. Right. Can I can I just ask? Um, maybe yeah. it's just a small a small um, question. Previously, you referred to the Node Disk Manager. Is is that the same as the Node Device Manager? Oh, that's right. So we started off calling it as a node disk manager, and then uh, last KubeCon, uh, we uh, wanted to see how to uh, make it more general purpose for all the other storage engines. Uh, so device made more sense because if you're running in a cloud, maybe they're not really backed by uh, disks. Uh, so we oh, I see. into node device manager. Yeah, good catch, Alex. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. All right. um, and then the other one that we uh, introduced since the last uh, KubeCon is, uh, is a node NDM operator. Uh, I, I'm still saying not this manager, but yeah, uh, it's an NDM operator that allows you to get a single point of control in terms of uh, uh, getting access to the disks. Uh, it basically works the same way as uh, uh, transition volume claims and uh, PVs. The only difference being uh, sometimes the storage engines can actually request for more than one disk uh, to be associated with a given storage engine. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why we didn't want to use the term uh, claim, uh, not to confuse with that. So uh, operators or, or other storage engine operators, in our case, CStore actually uses this. Uh, it uh, uh, puts in a request for uh, devices, and that will be uh, taken up by the NDM operator to look at what are the uh, nodes where the devices are available and then kind of associate them with the device request. And CStore operator basically uses these disks, right? Um, so when we are running local PV and as well as uh, CStore in the same OpenEBS cluster, uh, this kind of helps to uh, mark the boundaries. Cool. Uh, so getting into a little bit more into the uh, OpenEBS control plane, we, Talk about NDM, but NDM is actually treated like a separate project because it can be used for non-OpenEBS projects as well. Uh, so the OpenEBS normally com consists of the uh, storage operators. Uh, uh, so it has its own API server and a bunch of uh, operators depending on like uh, data engine. So there is a C store operator, etc. Right, and uh, the provisioners are. Uh, Launched as separate components or separate pods. So, yeah, we are basically following the same model of having a CSI side cast and all that, and the provisioner is one of those uh, parts. So, the, uh, and of course, we have a, so we are moving away from the entry iSCSI volume and uh, uh, having our own uh, CSI node agent that actually uses the lib iSCSI uh, component uh, that is again available in the six storage, uh, the six storage, right? Uh, so when you have SC and PVCs coming in, the provisional controller in turn uh, interacts with the uh, storage server and the operators that uh, typically launches a bunch of YAMLs. Uh, we call them as CAS YAMLs. They could be like custom CRs that provide the storage configuration as well as the KHS deployments itself. So it actually uh, stateful sets and deployments are uh, kind of created at that point in time. Uh, I'm kind of focusing on the management component. So uh, a typical volume component can contain a core data engine. Uh, that core data engine is kind of uh, uh, optimized to work standalone as well as within Kubernetes. And uh, the OpenEBS components uh, kind of help 
people to get communitized, if you will. Right. So you have uh, cast management, which is basically an uh, operator that looks at the uh, custom CRs for that particular data engine and has the knowledge to configure the uh, data engine. Uh, similarly, metrics exporter calls the internal API provided by the data engine to export the metrics. All right. If you have this uh, uh, parenthesis Maya here, meaning this is uh, only contributed by uh, people from Maya, not uh, by other companies, or what, what uh -huh. does that mean? So, um, okay, I, um, the control plane um, code is actually in OpenEDS Maya repository. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually an open source, it's contributed by multiple people. Uh, it's not related, uh -huh. Maya is not related to Maya data. Okay. Maya just means magic, and uh, when we started off this project, we were looking for names, and then the control oh, okay. named it as magic. Okay, I see. Uh, um, so, so just to clarify, so, so this sounds like there are different repos, right, for different bits of the project. Are you looking to, I mean, are, are we talking about um, considering open EBS and sort of its, its entirety or, or, or specific bits of the specific bits of the project. Right. Uh, so definitely looking at all the components of open EPS, uh, including the, all the control plane components are available in the open EPS uh, Maya repository. Uh, if I can just switch for a minute. Right. Um, so we use uh, open EBS, open EBS itself as a more of a uh, project management repository that uh, usually hosts the um, examples and uh, uh, operator YAMLs, etc. The control plane is all in the uh, Maya repository, and uh, Jiva is the fork of that uh, Rancher Longhorn project that we have, and Node Disk Manager. And uh, the C Store is also another project that uh, uh, is available under the OpenEBS repository itself. It's not been here, but it's uh, under this one. Uh, oh, go, go, go. Okay. So the entire OpenEBS org is what we are looking at open sourcing, and then we uh, we will get into the individual licensing things if uh, there's any problem kind of a thing. Right. Said uh, looking at open sourcing. Just to be clear, they're all open source. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> contributing. Well, are, looking at contributing all of them, and now they'll be even more open. Is the <laughs> Understood. Right. Um, so this one just uh, gives the same. Oh, sorry. I, I think I just control brain. Okay. Um, the last piece was about the OpenEBS operator that uh, we just talked about. It's getting added, and uh, a custom resource for OpenEBS is available that will help with uh, what data engines to enable or um, uh, ability to actually do a get OpenEBS to check the status of the various components, uh, that kind of stuff. Right. A uh, little bit of getting into how the Jiva data engine works. Uh, so you typically start with the storage node uh, that has host parts. And uh, whenever a uh, new PV is uh, launched, it uh, starts a Jiva volume topic, which is the ISCC service, which has a sidecar for my uh, metrics exporter. And then uh, depending on the replicas, uh, the uh, Jiva replica parts will be launched on different nodes, which make use of that host path. Right? And uh, the stateful application pod uh, itself will make use of the kubelet and the uh, CSA agent as the C initiator, one of them, uh, depending on what, in, what connection that we are using to connect to the service, uh, uh, ISCC as target service, and provide the data path. Right. So one of the reasons for using the service is uh, the Jiva volume target itself is stateless. So in case a node fails, that can actually get uh, uh, scheduled onto some other node, and the kubelet or like the uh, initiator will be only talking to the service IP instead of the actual target IP. Uh, so the Cisco data engine, uh, in terms of uh, comparing and understanding, it works the same way, just that instead of host path, it actually uh, makes use of the block devices uh, directly, right? Um, so I'm going a little bit quickly here so that I can jump into the demo. Right. Uh, so 
it's all the same here. Right? Um, Kieran, uh, maybe this will become a bit clearer on the in the demo, but um, I'm sort of struggling a little bit to understand which bits are kind of like internal components of the software and which bits are sort of logical components. I mean, when we say the C-Store data engine, are we talking about a container per node, a container per pool, a container per volume, what, what, or how, how does that look? All right, so I will actually take the question as part of the demo and I can actually show that one. Oh, excellent. Okay, thank you. So the next one was actually getting into this one. Uh, so I have a Kubernetes uh, cluster created on uh, uh, GKE. Right, it's a three node cluster. And uh, right now it's a pretty fresh cluster just before this uh, call I started it. Right, it's just a cube system that we have right now. Right? Okay, so to install the open EBS, I can just use the Helm stable chart, EBS stable chart. Right? Just to give it a minute. So everything, all the control plane components of OpenBBS are uh, installed in the OpenBBS namespace. Okay. Uh, so what you see here is uh, the API server or the storage controller that I talked about. And uh, these are uh, currently I'm using 081 version. So it's uh, the external storage provisioner and the snapshot operator that comes from there. And yeah, NDM daemon set is also running there on each of the nodes, right? Uh, so what this does is to make it easy to use in clusters where uh, there are no disks, we actually uh, make use of the uh, sparse disks to create a default storage pool. Uh, so let me just show what the uh, NDM did right now. So NM actually uh, goes ahead and uh, creates sparse disks. So let's just look at uh, not this disk. If it was a physical device, it would have called it as a disk and that one. This is a logical object, right? So it just says that uh, this particular device is available on uh, the Kubernetes host screen at one end. What's the size of that uh, particular disk, etc. Right, and if it was a real hardware, uh, you could actually have filled in all those details. Right. Cool. So now, uh, one of the things that would uh, happen uh, as part of the initial OpenAPS uh, starting up is it actually goes ahead and creates a C store sparse pool pods. Right. And this is basically controlled by a flag in the uh, OpenEBS install that says install default sparse pool. So we will look at uh, a serial get uh, this is a logical object that a custom resource that was uh, launched by the OpenEBS server uh, with a bunch of configuration, uh, which is uh, go ahead and uh, create a Cisco sparse pool and I need around uh, three pools, right? And type of the disks to use is sparse. Okay. Uh, for each of the um, sparse pool, the configuration of that will be uh, stored as part of the uh, CSP object. Uh, if you look at one of these things, uh, so again, a logical object, um, tells you on which node it is and all that, and then what is the disk it uses, uh, and then the uh, status of that particular pool. So now let's uh, get into a little bit more. 
details of this parse code, uh, get pods, and I said open APS. Let's look at how this code looks internally. So we saw the uh, custom resource, now we are looking at the pod itself. Oops. Uh, it basically has three containers in it. Uh, one of them is a core data engine, that's the CSTOP pool uh, container. And along with that, there are a couple of sidecars that are uh, launched. Uh, so the next one is the CSTOP pool management. Uh, this is the sidecar that actually uh, fetches the details from the uh, CSP custom resource, or the uh, storage computation. Uh, typically, in this case, there was only one disk, but if there were like two disks, do you want a mirror configuration on the disks itself? Or do you want to enable some other storage level parameters? Those things will be available in the CSP object, and that will be read, and then the pool uh, will be configured. And along with that, there is another sidecar that's for uh, uh, metrics. Okay. Uh, I think I must have uh, skipped through that one. Let's do this. Yeah, sorry. So on the uh, pool, uh, the metrics are available in 0 0.9, so that's why you have only two things at this point. My bad. So now that we have the pool uh, created, uh, we will go and try to launch a stateful application on that one. Okay. So we had a bunch of control plane components like the provisioner and uh, the uh, storage API server. And then we saw that there are uh, three pods that got created for each of the pools, uh, which had uh, uh, data container and the management container. I'm launching this one. So this one creates a PVC uh, called Pagona that's uh, basically using a OpenVSC store sparse pool and a new volume has been created, uh, PVC C901. So for this PVC, a new C store target will get created. For minus M OpenVS, we look at this one, a new target pod comes in for that. And we look at kubectl, uh, get pv. And so now uh, it's a entry iscsi pv at this point in time, uh, which uh, gives the service IP address. Right? Okay, let's we see. So not only yes, if I do it, I basically have that as the I see port, and this is the top, uh, service IP address on which the I see volume can be connected. So, it, it, it's that basically. Um, so, what's happening there is we, we, you're getting a nice SCSI service, sorry, an ISCSI target exposed as a as a Kubernetes service to the rest of the cluster. That's correct. Okay. So, if I do a describe part of this, uh, we get into. Basically, see that you can get to the ISCAS APV uh, within this one. Right. Yeah, this is this great. Cool. Uh, did that answer your question on the different ports that are available? Uh, Um, I'm still trying to press it all, to be honest. There was a lot to take in. Sure. Uh, let me actually just do one more thing. So, uh, be a bunch of time. Uh, these are the custom resources that uh, we uh, load. Uh, uh, one is the C store pool and the replica and the volumes and then the disks. Uh, for the NDM, 
and uh, for the actual system pool itself uh, the way we input is via the storage pool claim right and uh, all the uh, physical components are in the OpenDBS uh, namespace of the containers right I see. Okay. So, effectively, we have we have a pod per pool and a, a pod for each of the NDMs. Right, and then we have a pod for the PVC target for that to, to run the MySQL target service for that PVC. That's right. Got it. So, so does that mean we, we would get um, um, a pod per per PVC um, created within within the cluster? That, that's correct. So, whenever you add a new PVC, you are going to get another uh, uh, pod, right? So, um, basically, it, it has a shared set of pool pods, and then for every volume, you create one new target pod. Got it. Um, yeah, I, one of the other things that I have is uh, just to show how the high availability works. Uh, uh, this will be really quick. Cool. So we have all these uh, sister pool ports uh, that are already running when the new uh, PVC is uh, created. We create a system volume target pod that's uh, basically getting the IO packets from the via the ISCSI from the stateful application. And for each of the packets that it uh, receives, it basically synchronously replicates to the different pods. And as part of synchronous uh, uh, replication, it also actually appends a little bit of a header that uh, the system volume target uh, understands. Uh, you know, for simplicity sake, you can kind of consider that as a block uh, block ID, uh, uh, a unique identifier, right? Uh, that's kind of sent uh, into the different pools, right? And basically happens that way. And when the uh, one of the nodes fails, uh, the data will still be returned to the two other. Uh, pools and when the node comes back it can uh, sync the data back from the available uh, storage pools and also have a little bit of a table here uh, depicting the different failure cases and uh, how it handles the uh, failure scenarios right and the the so, so the replication is from the target pod that is sort of presenting the volume to the pools, to the different pools on each server. That's correct. Um, and is that um, synchronous or asynchronous or how does, uh, sort of what sort of consistency model is being used there? Right, it's a synchronous uh, replication right now. And then the rest of the data services, um, are they, so, you know, you, you, you mentioned things like um, snapshots and clones and things like that. Right. Are, are they um, implemented within the, within the target pod or, or within the pools? Awesome. So I, I think I have a slide on that one. Let me see if I can actually pull that up. Uh, it basically follows the um, external storage snapshot API. So when the uh, snapshot API comes in, the provisioner actually sends the request to the storage controller, and storage controller uh, accesses the C store target to take the snapshot, and C store target internally will uh, uh, synchronously make the call to. Uh, it basically pauses the IO and then uh, asks each of the C store. Pool to take a snapshot on the corresponding volumes replicas, right? And in case one of the node is not available when the replica was taken, when it comes back up, it basically uh, 
resends the data and then takes the snapshot uh, uh, at the it basically comes back to that state of taking the snapshot the snapshots also are uh, synchron uh, rebuilt comments um so I might have, sorry can i interrupt there very quickly with a question um i might have missed something but but i understood all three of those uh pools to be replicas as opposed to shards so so i'm not quite sure why you would snapshot all three of them and not just one uh, right so it's it's possible that uh, if we take a snapshot on one of them that pool might or that node might be actually completely gone and then when you want to take a clone or a restore to that one then we will not have that information so the snapshot is actually taken on all the uh, replicas um I'm, I'm still not sure i understand so so at any point in time you have to have three replicas available right and if one of them dies presumably you create a new replica on the fly uh right so the quorum kind of works with even if there are only two replicas the data is still served uh, so it's possible that when the snapshot request came there are only two replicas yes okay i understand that but then presumably you could choose either of the two and snapshot that or or i'm not quite I guess in in theory that one could fail in the middle of creating the snapshot. Is that is that why you snapshot all of them? Uh, let me get back with the answer uh, that went filled in. Um, so we since we actually do consistent, we wait we do the synchronous replication and we want to make sure the same state is maintained on all the replicas. But I think I understand your question. Uh, let me see if I can get back with the proper answer on the channel. Oh, okay, no problem. All right. So, so, so my question was not stupid. That that's all I really wanted to confirm. Um, so they are all identical, and it would, in theory, be possible to to snapshot one of them. But you do all of them for some reason. Okay, so that's good enough for me. Um, and presumably the the C store target pods, then you rely on. Um, Kubernetes restarting that pod on another node, presumably, if um, if there's a node failure or something like that, right? That's correct. So uh, what we do is we uh, set the uh, um, toleration levels to kind of restart uh, very quickly for these uh, target pods. Um, I've not yet started using the um, uh, I'm still exploring using the pod priority. Uh, again, some of these things are going to come as the uh, features get into uh, beta and are available in all the clusters. Some of the clusters where this is used are still old. Right? Okay. Um, and and does the does the stateful workload need to coexist on the um, on the same nodes with the the C store targets, or or can they be sort of independent? Uh, they can be independent. All three layers can be independent. Uh, 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 by default, they are independent. But you can also, for uh, depending on the storage admin, they can actually configure the policies to say that the workloads need to be on one of the storage uh, nodes, and also the target has to be only on those storage nodes or co-located always with the application, uh, these all translate into pod affinity, anti-affinity uh, rules. Right? Got it. Uh, you said you have a backup to, uh, do you have another backup engine or do you just use the snapshots for your backups? Oh, right, so uh, the uh, snap, these only support uh, snapshots, so basically they are like on disk snapshots for backup. We have integrated with the ARC uh, plugin, so the oh, ARC okay. can, backups can be sent to an S3 compatible storage. Okay. Okay, so, so sorry, one follow-up question. Then. So, so these snapshots are stored on the same machines and same disks as the, as the pools? Is the uh, snapshots are stored on the same uh, disk, yes. And then if we want to take a backup of these outside of this cluster, then we make use of the uh, FTR plugin or whatever.
what's called as a well error plugin right now. Okay, so you could back up the snapshots, I presume, asynchronously. Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Yeah, I guess normal the Amazon EBS kind of mixes the two concepts. I think the snapshots are actually remote, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's correct. So they are kind of backups. Okay, gotcha. Um, I'm available on the Kubernetes Slack channel as well as um, you can hit me up on the email. I'm on the uh, CNCF uh, email address. So we'll probably take more questions there. Peter, I'll definitely come back to you on that one question. And then one of the other things that we need to uh, check on, Alex, is the licenses. If we have reached out to you with uh, the different each of the projects that we have in the repository and what is the current license scheme that they have and what are the implications for that one? Yeah, that, 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 would, be, that would be good because um, I was just having a look, a look at the repos now, obviously the things like the so the first license and things like that have fairly controversial license requirements so historically, so we would just need to understand that a little better. And also, some of the repos looks like just uh, uh, some clones. It probably you are not really going to submit those, right? So probably identify what other repos you want to contribute. That's right, Zing. Uh, some of them are actually for uh, providing the uh, E2E infrastructure for OpenEBS CI itself, just like uh, cncf.ci, we have implemented openebs.ci. And there's also another open source project called uh, Litmus. Uh, uh, that's really uh, for running chaos uh, engineering or uh, chaos tests on the stateful workloads. Uh, those are also currently under the OpenEBS uh, repo. So I'll make a list of the things that become part of the core OpenEBS and then take it from there. That, that, that would be perfect. And if you could, if you could share that info information with um, Quentin and Shing and myself, please, we can take that forward then. Uh, Alex, just just by the way, the the licensing stuff. Usually, the CNCF, uh, the the Linux Foundation staff kind of sort out all the licensing stuff. They have lawyers, and they they understand open source licenses way better than us engineers. Um, so so we 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 can totally just hand over that stuff to them and tell them to sort it out. Um, it won't, you know, obviously the project won't be formally incorporated into the um, CNCF unless it can be changed to a compatible license, and sometimes that has, you know, it takes a while. Um, but, but yeah, in, in some sense, we don't really need to worry ourselves too much about that. Um, yeah, no, I understood it was more about cataloging it, that's all. Oh, I see, gotcha. Um, one uh, final question, which I think you guys answered to me on a previous call, but just for the rest of the, the people on this call, um, could you just give us some sort of indication of your main reason for wanting to open source, particularly to, to donate this to the CNCF and, and open source for that matter? Um, you know, people are going to ask how, how are you going to make money? Are you doing, you know, uh, open core or, you know, how, how do we assume that you're still going to be around next year if you open source everything? Evan, <laughs> would you like to take that question? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, but uh, yeah, it's a good question, uh, of course, but uh, no, we, we do have a, a model which says uh, for this, let's say persona who tends to uh, want to grab this and self-adopt, give them a hundred percent open source solution um, uh, for the enterprise. And then let's say the VPs who want to see everything maybe uh, begin to do some things like uh, programmatic controls um, and so forth. We have something we call, today we call it Maya Online, which is a SaaS solution that gives you, uh, you know, beautiful GUI and uh, we think beautiful okay. and, uh, management. So it is a, <laughs> not quite open core, um, but um, if you are a customer, we're actually using the SaaS product and hopefully the customer is as well to manage the environment. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Perfect. And and then your um, motivations. I mean, you mentioned you know marketing and that sort of stuff. Are you are you looking for significant amounts of contribution? Are you sort of we're needing? hoping we're hoping, uh, Quentin, and um, it's a little hard to know to what extent 
folks have been inhibited by us being a sole, let's say a sole vendor project, but that's the thesis here is that, um, that, you know, there, there have, we certainly we have like single, double, triple contributions by some folks who could do a lot of help. Um, yeah. so the goal would be to unlock some of that and then just, um, yeah, I, guess, I suppose the marketing or awareness, uh, piece that, uh, that you mentioned as well. Okay. But, but, but it doesn't sound like you're sort of, drastically short of engineering capacity. I mean, it sounds like you've done most of the hard work already and uh, you're, not, you're not sort of desperate for engineering horsepower so much as uh, adoption and awareness. Uh, yes, I think that's true. Um, Kieran, Kieran always tells me he's short of engineering horsepower on his team. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what all engineers do. We, we told we told to, to to say that every day. Uh, that's right. Cool. All right. Cool. I think we're officially out of time. That was really great. Thank you, everyone, for a very informative uh, thing uh, presentation. And yeah, we can take us forward. I think the next step is to actually put a formal proposal together and get some CNCF sponsors, and I can uh, some TOC sponsors. I can help doing that. Uh, unless anyone has any you know major objections. Uh, you can speak to me about it, but that, that's what I would suggest our next steps are. That, that makes sense. Um, Karen, would you be okay sharing um, the deck so we can, we can include a link to that with the, with the rest of the docs and on the agenda? Absolutely, yes. I, I will uh, send the uh, link to you, uh, Alex. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, yeah, you, so thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.